Le Louia. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest alone. And his name is Christ Jesus. Amen. A glorious day, LCC. It seems you're not convinced. <laughs> People usually react and reply. If I say good morning, you answer good morning. Yes. If I, 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 I greet you a blessed day, you agree you are blessed. But seldom of us don't realize that it is always a glorious day. For what reason? I don't greet you bless, blessed morning or good morning. Because if you are in Christ, you are already blessed. But why I greet everybody a glorious day is that it is a reminder for me that in spite of what is happening around us, still it is a glorious day because still God, Jesus Christ, still reigns on earth. He sits on that mighty throne in heaven. He is still a God who is in control. He is not caught by surprise. That's why even what is happening with you right now, whatever you're struggling from, it is still a glorious day. Still God reigns. Amen? Amen. So let's do it, part two. A glorious day, LCC. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. Are you excited for the word? Yes. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's word. Heavenly Father, all glory, all honor, and all the highest praise belongs to you alone. And your name is Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us once again to be gathered in your presence. Thank you for your protection. Thank you, O oh Lord God, that we have the freedom in this land of Kuwait, that we can hear from you, from your word. And Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you bless your word for us today. Father, your word is spirit, your word is alive, and your word is the only absolute truth that we need in this world. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that you prepare the hearts of every soul you allow to come here today. To those who are here in this studio, to those who are even listening right now, Father God in heaven, make your word alive to them at this moment right now. And I pray, oh Lord God in heaven, if we find favor in your eyes, Lord, the same message the, that you have preached 2,000 years ago in that Sermon on the Mount in the north part, northern part sea of the Sea of Galilee. Lord, I pray the same experience right now in the name of Jesus, the same encounter. Lord, not another sermon we want to hear, but an encounter with you, which you have given 2,000 years ago. And Holy Spirit of the living God, be glorified, be magnified in the hearts of your people today. And I pray, O oh Lord, that your people, O oh God, will tremble at your word. We need, Father God, as a spiritual surgery of our heart right now. And we will not just simply hear, O oh Lord, we will not hear from a human voice, but from the sweet, gentle voice of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen and amen. Two weeks ago, you know I don't like surprises. I can't handle surprises. When LCC secretary will give you a missed call, usually casual things, she will give you a text message. But two weeks ago, I received a missed call from our LCC sec secretary, our minister, MJ. And then I called her back, and I don't like surprises. And I, and I felt, I said, I, I was asking myself, I think Pastora Grace did not arrive yet in Kuwait. <laughs> and then I was right. She's still doing missions, as we have so, uh, seen her just a while ago. 
And Minister MJ asked me, Pastor Renner, Pastora Grace is not around. Can you please, I know already what you want to ask me. And now I'm here standing in front of you, going to preach the word of God, which many pastors and preachers escape to preach. And we will talk about adultery. Woo. And I pray to the Lord. Woo. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. And I just, before I called Sister MJ, I, I, I prayed to the God immediately before calling her. Lord, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> But yet I know in my heart. <laughs> And then I said in my prayer, Lord, if you, you were able to give a word to a donkey to rebuke a prophet, I am your image. I'm just your vessel, and I, and I need your spiritual boldness. It's not about the messenger, but it is about the message that the, your people needs to hear. And I will stand boldly, spiritually bold enough to declare what your people want to hear. And indeed, in Matthew chapter 5, in our new sermon, Radical Living Jesus' Way, Jesus Christ answers the forefront questions of the people. And these people, the multitude who was listening with him, eyeball to eyeball, eye contact, when he preached, he was not standing. He sat on that northern hill, uh, on that northern part of the Sea of Galilee, in that hill mountain, in the hills of that mountain, where many people have seen already his miracles, where many people already have heard his teachings. And yet, they have this question, are you the Messiah? If you are indeed the Messiah, why you are rejecting the law of Moses? In fact, never Jesus Christ rejected any law. Never he even abolished any law. That's why he said in verse 17, he summarizes all the questions of this question. People who ask him. And he said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill them. Jesus indeed completed what was preached in the Old Testament. And two weeks ago, we talked about the shocking passage in the Sermon on the Mount. You know what the shocking passage in the Sermon on the Mount It was in verse 20. Imagine many people, the multitude listening to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gave a shocking verse. And he said in verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And the people over there were all shocked. How on earth? It was indeed a radical Teaching. Jesus turned the hearts and the mind of the people upside down. How on earth that these scribes and these Pharisees are the most qualified to enter the kingdom of God. And now here is a prophet. Here is a rabbi, a teacher that they see Jesus during that time. And he said, unless you exceeded The righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom. You know what? If I am one of that multitude, immediately I will go out and stop listening on that sermon. And I said, I gave up because comparing myself, and if I'm sitting beside the Pharisee, my hands and my feet are all both raised up. No way. But Jesus, we know very well. That he's not talking about the external things that the Pharisees are trying to project. But Jesus' aim and Jesus' mission is what? What is happening inside of you that causes you to change. Jesus is stealing about the heart of the people during that days. And again, how Jesus explained it last week. 
in our house churches. He explained why he said that unless you exceeded the righteousness of the Pharisees, only you can enter the kingdom of heaven. The way he explained it, he gave six illustrations by giving six sins that deals with us. Not externally, but internally. And the first sin, the first illustration he said was about murder. If you will be hearing that you did not murder, did not kill, you will say, yeah, I'm exempted. Point one, one goal. But Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about physical murder alone. It is more than that. Unless you are keeping a brooding anger or a simmering anger or hatred against your fellow brother or against your fellow sister, you are more than like a serial killer who have killed people physically as well. That's his standard in his holy eyes. I don't know if anyone here did not commit spiritual murder, but let me just remind you and confess to you, I am one guilty person. Sometimes daily, especially in our place of work. I cannot even say good morning to my supervisor. <laughs> and in the silence of my heart, whew, I have killed my boss already. <laughs> Guilty as charged, murder. Am I the only one or am I just talking to myself? <laughs> Not only in our place of work, even inside the church. My fellow sister and my fellow brother just rebuked me. Pastor Kapanaman, you're already a pastor. Still you're doing this? And in the silence of my heart, I hope God already takes your life already so you can meet him. Again, I committed murder. <laughs> Am I the only one guilty here? How about in the house? <laughs> Let's start with my child. Son, throw the trash before you sleep. Daughter, wash the dishes and still the next morning, nothing happened. And in the silence of my heart, I hope you were not born. Just my wife and myself. Again, I committed. Spiritual murder. Am I having only the goals here? How about my wife? Whew. <laughs> Whew. I will not say it anymore. She's watching also. <laughs> After this service, I still have a preaching message in our, a service in our house. Otherwise, he'll be preaching. I just leave it to that. <laughs> but guilty as church, I committed murder. But you know what, brothers and sisters? Those silence in your heart against your fellow brother or sisters or colleagues, those silence are loud in the ears of God. We are guilty as church, charge. And now, Jesus Christ, I'm still in the introduction. Be ready. <laughs> oh, Pastor Alan. <laughs> Difficult message, 15, 15 minutes left. <laughs> he gave another illustration, Jesus, and he talks about adultery. And as you sit over there, you can even say in the silence of your heart, I'm not guilty. 
I am faithful. I have only one spouse. Hallelujah. This message is not for me. <laughs> Free of charge. But this is not what Jesus is trying to tell us. And we talk about adultery, the seventh commandment. And in Jesus' eyes, anger, sexual lust are two of the most powerful influences on mankind. And we are now in a generation with growing principle of sexual hedonism. We prioritize a sensual pleasure over other life values. Sexual hedonism, it is a principle believing that sex is like a biological act, just like eating, drinking, and sleeping that have no moral significance. And we are saying this in mass media, even in academic, even in religious circles, we see in seminars, books, tapes, programs of all sorts that promise to improve sexual knowledge, experience, freedom, and enjoyment. And we are in this generation that we see people treat sex like shaking their hands. And but Paul refutes strongly this idea by going on to say that God will do away with both of them that is food and stomach, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. This is not a new thing, even in the early Christian church. And this is the way Paul refuted and rebuked the early Christians in Corinth. They were practicing, they were practicing hedonism, the same way we are living right now. The body is more than biological, as divine judgment will reveal, but because we are Christian, we are the member in the body of Christ. When you got born again, your body does not belong to you anymore. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, meaning your body right now. If you are a born-again follower and believer, your body belongs now to Jesus Christ. And today, we will learn from the Word of God that adultery is a sexual sin. As Paul calls it, it doesn't start, here's the message right now, Adultery doesn't start on the bed. It starts in the heart. Someone said, adultery begins not under the belt, but above your neck. What is filling your mind right now? What fills your mind dictates your heart. Let's define first the meaning of adultery. Adultery is defined as a voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a partner other than the lawful husband or wife. Again, very clear on one level, adultery is simply the act of physical unfaithfulness to the marriage vows that is clearly prohibited by the commandment of God. But now the question is this, how does God feel then about adultery? God forever classifies adultery among the worst sins a person can commit. 
and surely it deserves a bad reputation. Name one good thing adultery ever accomplished something good. Name one homemade stronger by unfaithfulness. Point out the children made happier because someone broke his vows. Search the pages of history and see if you can find one good thing to say about adultery. Even one positive benefit of unfaithfulness. And I submit to you, there is no good thing about adultery. It tracks homes, it destroys lives, it harms children, and ruins reputations. And adultery is more than a physical act. Now, we will be on the same page of this because adultery is a problem of any human's heart. And to say this is just a tip of the iceberg. Jesus made it clear that adultery is the fruit of which last is the root. That's the beginning of adultery. If in our thinking we focus only on the physical act itself, we miss the greater lesson of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus' whole point is that it is quite possible to commit adultery in the heart without ever physically touching anyone else. You may outwardly remain faithful to your spouse while inwardly lasting after someone else. That inward lasting, though it remains hidden for years, is already adultery in the heart. The same like in anger. You never release anger. It is all in your heart like a, a dormant volcano. But in that anger and you refusing to release forgiveness, then you have committed murder to the person. You never release forgiveness. How full we are we knowing that the life of a person is only one time, but how many times already we murdered the same person in the spirit by not releasing forgiveness. And the same level as adultery is if we have a lustful intent to another person, to another opposite sex, we have committed adultery already over and over and over again in our heart. And it all starts with the root of adultery, and that is loss. L-U-S-T. Now, what is the meaning of lust? Lust means a strong desire, which can be positive or negative or neutral. Actually, before last has its origins, it is a neutral connotation of the term. However, the, world, the word last has evolved into the meaning of an intense sexual desire, often illicit and forbidden. And you know what? Why you and I fall many times in front of a holy God. And you know, the most powerful tool the enemy has been giving to us, his powerful tool that he never changed his formula over a thousand years ago, even since the creation of man, it is the power of lust. This is the only tool Satan is using against us. And he never changed his formula at all. In the fall, during the creation, he used lust to trick Eve and Adam. And what is that? We know it. Paul said it. It is the lust of the eyes, 
lust of the flesh, and pride of life. You know what I call pride of life as a lust? It is a lust of power. Pride of life is lust of power. I am right, you are wrong. That's power. That's privilege. So the devil never use any tool. And that is the power of lust. Ever since Eve and Eve, the Lord commanded Adam and Eve, you can eat anything in this paradise, yet do not eat any fruit from the tree of knowledge and evil. But Eve saw it was good, it was last of the eyes, so what she said, oh, let me taste this, that's last of the eyes. And then, the same thing the enemy did to Adam, the lash of the flesh. And the devil said to Eve, see, if you eat this fruit, your eyes will see and you will be thinking like God. Lash of the flesh. They want more than what? They can handle its flesh. You're not happy with one spouse. You need more spouse. Last of the flesh. And the last of power, the pride of life. What Satan said to Eve and Adam, you will be like God. And that's the powerful tool the enemy uses only for you and me. And Jesus said that the desire to have sex with someone other than your spouse is mental adultery and thus sin. Jesus emphasized that if the act is wrong, then so is the intention. To be faithful to your spouse with your body but not your mind is to break the trust so vital to a strong marriage. Maybe my presence is always with my wife, but if my mind is always flying and always thinking, yes, my body belongs to my wife. She can never catch me, but she don't know what is in my mind, that in my mind is not her, someone else, someone I saw in the television, someone I saw in a movie, I imagine that I already committed adultery against God. And there is no other very good illustration on how a man of God falls in this problem or sin of adultery. In the life of King David, just quickly, it really reveals us five steps that lead to his own self-destruction. Step one, quickly with David. Step one, the five step on how a godly man falls. Step one, David was not there where he was supposed to be. We know this very well, this story, isn't it? David is supposed to be in front of the battlefield fighting with his fellow generals, fellow soldiers, leaving the battle. But what David did, he became so comfortable. Wait, let me take a break. Let me go to my palace. I deserve a break. So what he did, he went to a place where he is not supposed to be, and he take a long break. And that was the story. He was not supposed to be there. That's why I am telling you, mga kapatid, if you have nothing to do, let me tell you the best workshop the devil likes. You know what? An idle mind and an idle body. If you have nothing to do and you just simply sit in the comfort of your own house, I am telling you, the, the greatest weapon of the enemy in the house, you know what? Remote control. Oh, come on. A nice and cozy air conditioning flat. And a good remote control. 
and, ex- and a 65 inches flat TV. Oh boy, no need to go to church. I'm relaxed. Anyways, I can go also to the service, go to YouTube. I have the best praise and worship team. If not Don Moen, Hillsong, Elevated Worship, in the front of my finger, in the comfort of my fingertips, in the comfort of my house, with the remote control. I'm idle. And also, an idle body, the devil also likes an idle mind. If you have nothing to put in your mind, you don't want to read the Bible. You don't want to pray because you don't want to do anything. You are so comfortable. So I'm telling you, the devil will make an input. He will upload everything in your mind. Because this is the real battle. So, like David, he was not in the place where he is supposed to be. He should be in the battle. And you and I should not be complacent. You and I should never be comfortable. But we should always seek the Lord. Amen? If we are not seeking the Lord, the enemy will put something else in your mind and in your heart that he wants you to seek for. Are you with me? Don't make me nervous. If people are nervous in the congregation, two things. It's either the word is hitting your nerves or you already started sleeping. (laughs) I hope it's the first one. Stage two, step number two. He looked at something he shouldn't have seen. So he was there at the wrong place. He was stretching. And then he saw something. Stretching. Ah, nice weather. It's fall now. There's no problem in seeing. He, what David saw? He saw what? But Sheba taking a bath. Church, there's no problem in seeing. But the problem is looking. David saw, but Sheba. Oops. But the second glance was the dangerous one. Oops. Oops, and more oops. <laughs> and that put David in trouble. Brothers and sisters, you cannot stop your eyes from seeing. That is given. But you can stop your eyes from looking. Adultery is a matter of the heart that starts from the eyes. Eyes is the light of your mind. Where your eyes is looking, it fills your mind. And whatever fills your mind, it dictates your heart. And whatever now is in your heart, it leads you to act. And see what the enemy is doing? And then step three, he asked a question he had no business asking. Verse 3, David said in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, is that Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? On the surface, this appears to be an innocent act. What's wrong about asking? Isn't it? Note that the last is well hidden at this point. It's not yet obvious. No adultery has taken place yet. In fact, no one seeing his action would condemn David. Outwardly, he has done nothing wrong. He just asked that, who's that beautiful lady taking a a spa? (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. But inside, in his mind, he has already slept with Bathsheba. The deed is done in his imagination before she even knows he has seen her. And at this point, it is not difficult to understand David's thinking. Oh, how the mind can rationalize lust. David in his mind, I'm alone. She's alone. God wants me to be happy. 
I'm tired in this battle. I deserve to relax, to have also a spa. And in that spa, in his mind, I want to join her with that spa. I have the right to be happy. David, in his mind, he is already rationalizing his loss. My marriage to Michal was never God's will in the first place. No one will ever know. It is as much her fault as not as my fault. And Luz has done already his work in the mind of David. Though no outward sin has taken place, David has already broken the seventh covenant, the seventh, seventh commandment, thou shall not commit adultery. It's not yet obvious in the eyes, but already he is guilty in his heart according to the eyes of God. This tiny act of adultery is dangerous. Now you can simply sit there and comfortable. Oh, Pastor René, I never had done that in my mind. Really? <laughs> Let us see. If you have a spouse and your spouse don't know the password of your cell phone, <laughs> hmm, hmm. Mm-hmm. And your spouse does not have a privilege or what you a password to, to check your own Facebook or to open your own email because it is filtered by you. Uh-huh. If your spouse doesn't know that you are giving private messages. With an opposite sex, uh-huh. <laughs> we are no different with David committing tiny acts of adultery in our hearts. If you are married, let me tell you, you are already in covenant as one flesh with your wife or with your husband. One flesh meaning one body. Can you give to me a body who doesn't know that his body don't have a hand? Can you point to me a body who doesn't know that he has a head? Because a body in one flesh, when you get married, you are already in covenant as one flesh to your spouse. Let me tell you, if you are married, you have no more private life. Your body does not belong to you anymore. It belongs to your spouse and most of all, belongs to God. In step number four, he sought something that wasn't has his to have. His last now leads him into deliberate sin. Then David sent messengers, messengers to get her. There is, there is a clear abuse of power. It happens all the time with men who think they are beyond the law. David now thinks to himself, I can do anything I want. The unstated premise is not even God can stop me. And he orders his general to take Bathsheba and bring her to his private room. David knows Bathsheba is married. David knows her husband is away. He knows that adultery is wrong. He knows he should not do it. This is the man who wrote, the the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the same one now deliberately sinning against God, and it was his lust that made him do it. The power of lust. And last step that David did, he did something he never should have done. And the deed happens quickly. She came to him and he slept with her. And it probably started about sundown and was over by 9 or 10 o'clock before Uriah 
comes back home from the battle. It was just a short one night stand. And let me tell you guys who believes in one night stand. Let me tell you this. If you think a one night stand will not bring any damage with you physically, morally, and spiritually, let me tell you what happens if you have a one night stand to a person you have no understanding who she is or who he is. Let me tell you this. And let me just read to you. It is, it is here in First Corinthians chapter 6, 15 to 16. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scripture says the two are united into one. If you have gone into bed to an opposite sex which is not your spouse, you're not your wife, not your husband, whatever baggage that person have, you started having them as well. I did not say it. I just read it. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 to 16. So Bathsheba comes to David that it is done and she goes back home. At first, it appears that David has gotten away with adultery. He was laughing. He was saying, whippy, let's go bananas. It was just a one night stand. And a short time later, Bathsheba sends message. Bathsheba sends a text message. Yeah, it was a text message. That changed the life of David forever. And it was the text message, David, I am pregnant. Pregnant? That's impossible. One night stand? Short time? How could it be? One can only imagine the look on David's face when he hears the news. And at the very end of 2 Samuel 11, we read these words, but the thing David had done displeased the word. First, there was lust. Then there was adultery. Then there was deceit. Then there was a murder. And then there was a deceitful marriage. In the end, David did not get away with anything. He sin found him, uh, found him out, right? God sent a prophet to David, Nathan, and rebuked David. He was living all carefree. I am righteous. I'm going to church. I have a perfect attendance. I'm even standing already in the pulpit. I am good. Until one day he was rebuked by a prophet. And David's cover up failed miserably. And that punishment far outweighed the pleasure of adultery. Let me tell you this in this uh, monitor. Adultery, sexual sin, as Paul calls it, is a moment of pleasure and a lifetime of pain. It is not worth it. In Proverbs 6, 32 to 33, but a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does so destroys himself. His disgrace and shame will never be wiped away. That's tough. That's hard. And there is more to the story. And let us draw to the obvious point. David said, never said to himself, I think I'm going to commit adultery today. Never, never, never said, I think I'm strong today. I think I'm not going to commit adultery today. It didn't happen that way. In fact, if you had suggested to David, better David come at 2 p.m. You start it. Maybe you will not commit adultery. No, it was a surprise attack by the enemy. He would either have laughed at such a foolish thought if he did not go home, right? At that time, if he was in the right place in the battlefield, he could have not committed adultery. But it happened. Because why? Adultery is a subtle monster, a subtle sin that starts from the heart, that begins from your mind and thoughts, and not from the bed. 
Consider how many of the Ten Commandments David broke by his lust. Imagine, he coveted another man's wife, breaking the Ten Commandments. He stole Bathsheba for, from Uriah, breaking the Eighth Commandment. He committed adultery, breaking the Seventh Commandment. He bore false witness against Uriah, breaking the Ninth Commandment. He had Uriah murdered on the battlefield, breaking the Sixth Commandment. He dishonored his parents by his adultery, breaking the fifth commandment. He dishonored God by his adultery, thus breaking commandments one of four. He broke all the nine commandments except one. In his rush to sin, David managed to overtly and covertly break all ten commandments. And it all started with lust. Last is the worst of all the sins. In, the, in that, it promises you everything but delivers nothing at all. The more you last, the less satisfying it becomes. It seems harmless to take a second look. Ooh. The third look, oops. The fourth look, again, oops, 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 oops. And until it is too late. You are sleeping. That's why adultery, I keep on telling every time I minister to people, especially to couples, always they tell them, I was caught by surprise. I never know it will happen that I will be having another partner in my life. No, don't tell me because adultery never happens in one in an overnight. You have thought about it. You were not just aware with it. You incubated it. You simmered it in your heart. That's why you, you, it is not a surprise that you cannot tell me that, Pastor, I'm surprised the person I am lying in bed right now is not anymore my wife. No! It was a premeditated act like the same in murder. We committed sin of murder and adultery. Now, malapit na Pastor Alan, 10 minutes na lang. Are you still okay? Whew. Because you want to be free from lust. Parang they are the only one convinced. Let me repeat that. Don't make me nervous. You want to be free from lust. Now, let us three and take these four decisions that lead to a life to be free from lust. Number one, I must purposely avoid lust producing situation. This is an extremely personal matter. Each one must know his own limits. And each one of us is different. Maybe you have no trouble about lust of the flesh. Even I tell you that you run away from things that can entice you, you can sleep with it. You're not affected. You don't have the lust of the flesh. It is a personal matter. Maybe it is not the lust of the flesh. Maybe you have trouble with lust of the eyes. You want always to go to avenues. Always sail. Now it is sail again, changing weather. I love Kuwait. Everyday sail. Oh... Oh, <laughs> again, I'm confessing myself. I'm the only one guilty over here. Always looking friends, working in Alsaya, getting 30% discount. <laughs> or, no, Pastor, I'm not, no, I'm not buying things. I said, I have my own many stuff. Really? How about eating in restaurants, asking for 30% discount? P.F. Chang, Fridays. Ooh, I love 30%. Hey, you just ate yesterday. No, I have a brother now in the church. I love LCC. Too much working in, in, in ano yung, ano yung pangalan? Alshaya. She's my sister. I need 30% discount. Last of the flesh. Or maybe you're not suffering from the last of the flesh. Last of the eyes. Maybe you're suffering from last of power. Last of prestige. The pride of life. So know where your limit is. Purposely avoid last producing situations. But there is a line that you must not cross. You should know your limits. Amen? Me, I myself, I know. 
I hate remote controls. If I, if my son will tell me, Dad, there's a new series. <laughs> Forget the series, I cannot prepare the message. <laughs> know your limits. Amen? Letter B. Second, I must purposely avoid provoking lust in other people. Mm-hmm. Ladies, let me bl- be blunt about this. You think we are the only ones guilty of lust? We are living in a visually oriented society. It is so easy to mislead others by the way we wear our clothes or by the way we carry ourselves. Sometimes we as Christians think as if freedom in Christ means we no longer need to worry about how other people think or feel. Say this. If you are wearing revealing clothes that makes men to lust, you are as guilty as the man who committed lust in his heart. Don't come to church, please. You can dress up modestly, but don't come to church as if your fellow brother in faith is coming to and eating inside KFC. You know what I mean by that? They think they are in KFC. They are always seeing thighs and breasts. (laughs) I'm going to the church. We are going to a church. We are not going, ladies, to KFC. To enjoy breasts and thighs. We are in the church. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So we are all on the same boat in here. We all both committed last. And the guy says, Amen. <laughs> Let us see. Third one. I must purposely choose purity. The decision to choose purity must be made in advance based on a daily walk with God, grounded in a life of healthy activity. I told you a while ago, do not be evil. The devil's workshops is the evil mind, an evil body. If you don't have anything worthy to do, the devil will put everything under his power to make you busy. For his sake. Amen? And number four, this is powerful. Find an accountable person about your personal struggle. But when you find an accountable person, please, about last, don't go to an opposite sex. Come on, I'm getting clear with this. No, pastor. I'm closer to my sister than to my brother. So let me just be accountable with her. No! Last is such a tricky matter that you will never win the victory on your own. Let me say that again. You will never win victory over last simply by praying for your, by yourself. You need an accountable person. And God never intended you to fight this battle alone. So what's the intake of this message? How did Jesus Christ told those multitude in that Sermon on the Mount 2,000 years ago to avoid or loss? Or not to commit adultery. What Jesus said. He said this. If your right eye causes you to sin. My goodness. (laughs) See the radical teaching of Jesus Christ. 
You're lasting. You're committing adultery. And this is what he said. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. My goodness. What are you telling? Next Sunday, I will come here. No more right eye. <laughs> what are you saying? Radical teaching eh. My right hand? Are you ready for this? An eye is a source of our own comfort. Can you live a comfortable life Without your eye? No such. Nobody don't want to have one eye or especially both eyes. You will never live a comfortable life. How about the right hand? Right hand is a, because Jesus is talking here figuratively. And right hand is what? It is a symbol of strength. Most people's power comes from the right Seldom few on left-handed. Right hand is a, a symbol of strength. And what Jesus is trying to tell us there, pluck out your or gauge out your right out, cut up your right hand. If your comfort in this world is leaving you or leading you away from the presence of God, or if your strength leaving you because your strength, I am happy in this life. I have a stable job. I have a good salary. You are doing all it in your own strength, and the Lord is telling you, if you really want to follow me, deny yourself. Leave your comfort zone. And stop doing everything now in your own strength and come follow me. This is what Christ is telling us. Not your physical eye, but a symbol of your comfort. If you're so comfortable of where you are right now and you are not in Christ, you know it in your heart. The comfort, your own comfort is leaving, leading you away from the Lord. And now you're doing all things in your own strength. And still you fail because you are apart from Jesus Christ. See, in the world we are living right now, it takes more than willingness to overcome this world. Please listen with me here. If you want to follow Christ, and now in the present generation we are living in, it takes more than willingness. It takes more than commitment. Maybe you are now you are here because you are willing to come. But Jesus is asking more than willingness right now. If you want to overcome this world, maybe you are committed, you are serving. It takes more commitment right now. What Christ is calling us, but the Christ is calling people right now who are ready to crucify themselves for the glory of God. And in this generation right now, let me tell you, we need people in the church who will crucify themselves for the glory of God. That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is not longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and saved me and gave himself for me. You want to walk in the Spirit? You want to walk and worship God in spirit and in truth? Church LCC, God is looking for people who, will, who is ready to crucify themselves for his glory. Maybe it's too hard for you. It's your first time to be here in the church, or it's your first time to hear this message. But start with the willingness, followed by the commitment. 
and get ready to be crucified. Are you ready for that? Oh, only 40%. Are you ready to be crucified? And let me tell you this. You cannot do this alone. The spirit of adultery or the sin of anger, you cannot do it alone. We need Christ Jesus. You are here today, or even you are watching this live or in record. The reason you are listening right now, because God is not done with you yet. And he wants you to repent and come back to Jesus.